Welcome back to MXP Los Angeles. I'm Brad. With me is Andrew. We're going to be covering a modern 20K going around two in just a moment. Got Dana Fisher on Gruel Elves. And she is battling against Four Color Nadu. Yeah, so this Nadu list, uh, the Four Color list, uh, mainly plays black for Orphish Bowmasters, a pretty convenient card in the deck, just providing two bodies, some incidental value, some one ring hate for the various Jeskai decks. It was pioneered primarily by Canister online prior to the Pro Tour, uh, but kind of fell out of favor there. It's a little less sort of focused, it has a little bit more dubious mana, and so most pros chose to go with the more traditional Bant Nadu, and that has been kind of the, the flavor of the week since. Um, that said, against Elves, uh, sort of in his traditional deck, as it were, uh, having Rush Bowmasters seems invaluable. I mean, can you imagine your opponent spending two mana on a Priest of Titania, and you pay two mana, kill it, and make two bodies yourself? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, kind of an incredible exchange, if that ever happens. All right, Andrew, uh, I have not seen a Gruel Elves deck list. Have you seen this before? I'm curious what the... Uh, obviously, Dana really loves her elves. She's been playing th them forever. But can you sell us on this deck? Uh, I don't know if I can sell you on it, but I can explain it a little bit. Uh, the idea is that, well, in MH3, the elves deck picked up some new tools. I mean, the main one being Priest of Tania. Uh, at this point, the elf deck has almost every card that it had sort of in its uh, extended incarnation at sort of the, the peak of its power. Uh, except for Glimpse of Nature, uh, you know, the deck has Wirewood Symbiote, it has some of the newer tools like Elvish Warmaster, um, and it has the ability to produce a really absurd board extremely quickly. Uh, it has the Heritage Druid Nettle Central Engine, it has the ability to bounce its creatures to repeatedly draw cards with things like the Leaf Crown Visionary, uh, obviously it lets you play green per L spell to draw cards, and that has some really explosive potential. If this deck is interact with, it can kill you really quickly. Uh, I'm not sure that it's really quickly enough to consistently say race an Anadu deck. And I also think that Sweepers, the Updeck Traditional Bane, are still a massive problem. The deck still has very few tools. And if the opponent isn't too fast, the else deck can do some explosive stuff. All right, we're going to turn three. Dana on the left with Gruel Elves. That's a pair of Llanowar Elves, and I believe that is Elvish Warmaster. That is Leap Crown Visionary. Oh, Leap Crown Visionary. Excuse me. So, so this is the kind of glimpse effect in the deck. It has the text, whenever you cast an spell, you can pay green to draw a card. So this is the card that will allow the most explosive turns if Dana can get enough mana. Um, now, right now, she does not have either of the two main advantages of the decks down. She doesn't have Heritage Plus Sentinel, nor does she have the Priest of Titania. And therefore, her potential is kind of limited by mana. But as long as you look at visionary, cards are almost not a concept for you. Dana with a pair of, uh, well, with another threat, that's another copy of Leaf Crown Visionary. She drew a card, activating the first one off the trigger, and passed back to Kale. Kale with just Springheart and Antuko and Anurza Saga going up to um, chapter three. Yeah, but Dana is now completely tapped out. She's completely shields down. Kale is finding the Shuko. If there is a blue lane Anadu here, I, look, the lethal's not deterministic, but it's lethal. <laughs> In general, if you control Nadu, Shuko, and... Um, sorry, and the... Uh, Bring her the they are dead. Yeah, sorry, I was blanking on the card name for some reason. But yes, if you control Springheart, Shuko, and Nadu, the game is over. And Kale's 2 to 3 is fetching pretty quickly here. I think this game might be about to, yeah, to end. Additionally, I want to highlight the fact that Dana attacked after playing at Lee Crown Visionary. Uh, that's sort of a sign of weakness, you know? It, there's a lot of spells she could have played there, and she chose not to play anything. It, probably means her hand isn't very good. I suspect her hand is land-heavy. Maybe she's drawn some of her awkward tutor targets, such as Creative Behemoth. 
Uh, it just it's hard for me to name cards she might play, might not she would not have played. Now maybe she could have some elves that she's holding to draw more cards next turn. It's possible, but I I don't think it's that likely. Also, in third turn, we've cracked Burden Catacombs for an overgrown tomb. We've shocked it in and tapped. Spring Heart Name Tuco has triggered a couple of times. Dana, big help with grabbing those tokens for us. Well, overgrown tomb is a great sign for Dana because if he just had the naughty lined up, presumably we would have seen Breeding Pool. Oh, uh, uh, what are we going to port of calling for naughty? <laughs> All right, so that, that means we're about to enter the Nadu phase of the game. So what's going to happen now is Kill is going to target each of his creatures twice with Shuko. Each time Kill does that, he's going to look at the top card. Uh, he's going to be able to put into play if it's a land, creating another creature from the Nikuto. And if it's not a land, he's going to leave it in his hand. Uh, this process could theoretically stop if Kill bricks on lands many, many times in a row. But honestly, with this many looks and the Kuto already out, I would say Kill is over 90% to win here. Um, the ultimate win condition from this is going to be a little bit complicated. Uh, I can't explain it, but I'd prefer not to. Uh, let's just say that once you draw your deck, winning is pretty trivial. There's a lot of ways to kind of cut that particular uh, Gordian Knot. And, you know, the, the details are, are best left to the imagination. Absolutely. So what we're watching now is Hale going through the motions. Equipping Shuko to these various tokens. Uh, we've got a handy little visual aid to see which creatures have zero Nadu um, triggers and which have one or two. Yeah, and you can see that Hale's set of cards that sort of have zero Nadu triggers on them isn't going down very quickly because for every creature that moves to the has a trigger twice zone another token is kind of entering the zero zone uh, this doesn't really stop from this point nope uh i'll just stick to you you know important things that happen uh until then Kale's just going to be fiddling with his deck until dana decides she's had enough um it is important to note that the cards are revealed so if you think that the Nadu player is on a atypical build or perhaps has, you know, some spicy heat in it, you may want to sit down and watch for a few minutes until uh, most of the deck is revealed. Yes, I oh, agree. Um, in this case, though, I do think that uh, Dana saw the Overgrown 2, which means she probably knows this is a, a Bowmaster list. That's pretty much the only black card Nadu decks ever play. And honestly, that might be all she needs to know. I, I don't think she cares too much about the exact configuration of the deck. And I also think that Nadu decks just don't vary that much. They all have kind of the same cards. Um, anyway, now we're going to go to the sideboard games. Uh, Dana does have a fair number of hate cards for Nadu in her sideboard. Um, as well she should, since... Fundamentally, she's playing kind of a non-interactive goldfish deck, and she needs those hate cards because the Nadu deck is the more consistent and faster non-interactive goldfish deck. So she's going to be boarding these Harsh Mentors, uh, a natural hate card for the Nadu deck. She's going to be boarding these Force of Vigors, can take out Shukos or Zasagas, uh, maybe even something like a Haywire Mike, depending on how the game develops. She might be boarding in uh, this Collector Oof, I'm not sure. That does stop Shuko, but does nothing to Outrider. So it's a bit of an awkward hate card, but it might still be good enough. She might also choose to have Masked Vandal in. It's kind of a tutorable answer to these cards, uh, a tutorable way to, to blow up a Shuko or a Saga, etc. It also is an elf, for whatever that's worth, as it is a changeling. So yeah, some configuration of those sort of hate cards are going to come in. Uh, on the Nutty side, I doubt that Kale is like familiar with the elves matchup. I don't think he's probably ever played it before in his life, would be my guess. Um, however, he probably knows that, look, Dana has some sort of hate. He doesn't know exactly what. He'll board in some generic hate answers. Uh, not sure he's going to too much, but these fatal pushes, these thought seizes, maybe grist, stuff like that is going to come in. Just ways to answer whatever hate Dana brings to bear. As far as her plan A goes, Kill is mostly going to ignore it and just hope that he's faster. And I think that plan is pretty reliable. Agreed, agreed. Um, Dana grabbed a whole grip of sideboard cards now. She might be just doing a head fake here and pretending that she's boarding in 10 cards, but but it looks like she's grabbed 
just about everything that you mentioned and possibly other stuff too. Uh, there's also Magus of the Moon and uh, Soul's Jailer, Phyrex and Revoker. She's got access to about a hundred ways to interfere with Nadu's plan. Well, that is definitely true. The problem with that is twofold. The first problem is, okay, Nadu is pretty good at answering hate cards for itself. Court of Calling, in addition to finding Nadu, can usually find a way to handle whatever hate piece you've brought to bear. If it's a creature, maybe that's Volatile Stormdrake. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a non-creature, it's, it's a bit trickier, but often these other decks will have access to something like a Rex Sage uh, or maybe a Grist if it's a Planeswalker uh, to, to handle that threat. Um, Haywire Might, another one. Basically, it's very hard to stop Nadu with any single card. It will slow them down, it will buy you time, but it won't really put the nail in the coffin. The other problem is that Dana's deck is pretty linear. Fundamentally, she's playing elves. Every non-elf she boards in makes her Leap Count Visionaries worse, makes her Elfish War Masters worse, makes her Heritage Druids function less reliably, it makes her Priesthood makes less mana, it makes her whole deck function less well. Whereas Kale's deck isn't really like that. His deck is fundamentally an AB combo deck, and can kind of, he can kind of surround that AB with whatever pieces he needs. And therefore, as both players dilute their decks, I expect Kale to improve more than Dana, even though she boarded in many cards. Agreed, agreed. There's a reason the Elves deck isn't at the forefront of the uh, modern format. But, um, you know, I, I'm i one of those people who definitely says, play what you know. And if, if what you know is Elves, I say, play that. Well, that's certainly fair. And look, Nadu honestly isn't that popular right now. It's in a weird space where it's obscenely broken, but everyone knows it's going to get banned. And therefore, a lot of people don't want to invest in the cards. They're very hard to locate. Uh, it's a lot to spend on stuff that's going to lose its value very quickly. I totally understand why people wouldn't want to play a deck that's going to be banned in like nine days. And therefore, if Dana's plan is to hope to dodge Nadu, look, that's a reasonable plan. It might work. I don't think there's that much Nadu in the room. Here's Priest of Titania, or please don't have Orcish Bowmasters in your hand. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is, Dana didn't play a one-drop here, right? She just played a land and passed. And to me, what that communicates about her hand is, well, it's probably got some hate cards in it. Because her deck is a lot of one-drop elves. You know, like, what, half her deck is one-drops or something? It's a huge percentage. So given that she didn't have a one-drop, what does she have? I, I kind of think the answer must be a bunch of these sideboard cards. Maybe four of figures in her hand. Maybe Harsh Mentor. And she's deploying the Priest first to get more access to more mana. But I suspect next turn we're going to see at least one hate card come down. I would agree, and wouldn't you know it, Pale had the Orcish Bowmasters, Priest of Titania, into the bin. Turn three for Dana Fisher. Is she dressed up like Chandra right now? That's great. <laughs> uh, I believe so, although I'm not a, I'm not a cosplay scientist. Uh, you know, they... I, I My job is to know magic cards, not uh, not identify <laughs> costumes, but, but yes, I, I believe you are correct. She usually dresses as something at each tournament she attends. Anyway, sure. second verse, same as the first. We're going to see another piece of Titania hit the table, and we're going to once again hope the kill doesn't have an Arkish Bowmasters. Um, you know, what, what are the odds is too, after all? Pretty low, I'd say. But uh, let's see what he's got. Notably, Dana did miss her third land drop. That does lead me to, ble lead me to agree with your earlier point of her holding a grip of cyborg cards. Yes, but I mean, I and I think if Kale is paying attention, he knows that too. He should know that because she was their land drop, because she can play one drop, both those things are pretty unusual. They should be setting up alarm bells. Uh, he should have a good sense of what's in her, in her hand and play accordingly. Now, it's hard for me to say without knowing specifically what's in his hand, uh, what playing accordingly means, but maybe it means he's less focused on the combo, just plays a fair game, develops for a while, uh, kind of do things at your leisure. Maybe maybe get Nadu down more as just a 3-4 body to get some value rather than going for things immediately. There's a lot of kind of latitude for him to make her life awkward. Oof, that is a second Bowmasters to take the other uh, Precipitating off the battlefield. Now, I guess it's only fair that if Dana has two of those, that Kale has two Bowmasters. Yeah, so now Dana plays the Collector Oof, which is, as we discussed, a hate card. It will stop the Shugo combo. It doesn't stop Outrider, but still pretty annoying for Kale. But in this specific situation, it's just not 
clear that Kale even cares. Does he even need to combo to win this game? Can he just win by attacking? Uh, it, it's... It's not clear at all that the Collector Oof matters. Just in case it did, here's a Fatal Push. Did I, did I lose you? No, oh, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> my apologies. Yep. My apologies. Uh, just... Springheart and Antuco comes down. Uh, Fatal Push takes away Dana's third creature. Dana's now on her back foot. Nine life. Facing down a, well, a lot of damage. Uh, delighted Halfling as well. Joined before Kill passed the turn. Uh, deploying the... Uh, Pulling the enter the battlefield tap land, not a great sign for Danny here. Looks like we're not only playing on our back foot, but we're going to have to bolt ourselves to make green mana. Here's a pair of elves. Yeah, the, the problem is still that this Nankujo on the Bowmaster is, is going to be savage here. It means that every single land Kel draws is another ping and this orchestra and this orc token growing. And unfortunately, many of Dana's creatures are 1-1s. One uh, you know, this Leaf Crown Visionary is a target. This token is a target once Leaf Crown Visionary leaves the battlefield. Uh, but the pain just does not stop now that this Kuto is down. And this is demonstrating some of the real resilience and strength of this Nadu deck. Ailes isn't winning this game with a combo. His deck can kill on turn 3, but it's not even going to. He's just going to win grinding out with its fair cards. And that is absurd. We'll say Springheart and Tuco on an Orcish Bowmasters is, is that's that's hot. I like that a lot. It's gonna play really well here against Dana's deck of one and two toughness creatures. A copy of Bowmasters, thanks to the name Tuco's trigger. All right, we're getting the Dry Arbor, might as well. Just get a few more bodies on the board while we're at it. Kill your token, grow the Orc. Another Bowmasters. The Orc army is very large now. This is lethal, I believe. No, we've got a chump block for the large army. I mean, it certainly is lethal in the sense that if Dana didn't block, she would be dead. And it's also lethal in the sense that, look, she's going to chump block, but it's going to be nowhere near good enough. There's a Force of Vigor. Picks out the uh, Springheart and Tuco as an enchantment. A chump block. Dana's going to drop to a precarious life total with no cards in him. Yeah, I think it's just too little too late. I mean... Hell's board is massive. I don't know what Dana's best draw even is. Uh, I think this match is over. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, the uh, this um, outdated model of Nadu, this four color model, like the Bowmasters were so clutch in, in just wrecking Dana here. Uh, I know. I know. You said people have moved on from that because you know the Bant Nadu deck is so tight. It's so. Um, it's definitely proven itself as the better version of Nadu, but there will be matchups where the Bowmasters plays real well. Oh, absolutely. I'm not trying to say that the uh, kind of four, the four color deck has no upsides. I do think it's better against one of the toughest creatures. I also think it's better against one ring control deck, such as Jeskai. Uh, I just think that other matchups are more important as the game currently stands. But, uh, Yes, it's definitely not crazy to register at all. And, you know, there might be metagames where it's a wise call, you might say. Even though I think typically you'd rather be playing the band version. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, we're going to go to our backup match here. This is going to be game three of Cedric Phillips of the Receivables fame versus Kevin Ryberg of I Don't Know Him. Uh, and we're going to watch Is It Merktide versus Bant Nadu. Each players have a game. 
Now, how does this matchup typically play out for you, Andrew? So this matchup is, I think, pretty interesting. Uh, the reason it's interesting is, well, uh, the Murktai deck is fundamentally a deck full of uh, kind of efficient threats and interaction. It's going to try to stop the Nana deck from doing its thing as long as possible. And it does have some pretty good tools to do that. It's got removal, it's got counter magic. Um, it's definitely possible for the Murktide deck to succeed. Uh, that said, the, the challenge is going to be that the Murktide deck is going to have to have kind of all the right answers at all the right times. Our deck is going to attack Murktide from a lot of different angles, and that is where the challenge lies. Uh, let me give you an example. Maybe you're playing the Murktide deck, and you draw your opening hand, and your hand is, say, a threat, maybe a Tamiyo, and a bunch of counter spells. You're like, great, I'll play Tamiyo on one, I'll make some clues, I'll counter everything they do, I'm all set. You play Tammy on turn one. On turn one, they play Delighted Halfling. Suddenly, all your counter spells are blank. Now, the reverse is also a problem. Maybe your hand is all removal spells. But then, they just play Nadu as the first play, and your removal spells are all getting two for one immediately. Or maybe they have Outrider in play already, so when the Nadu enters, they can draw a bunch of cards unless you kill the Outrider. It's sort of hard for them to have just the right mix of stuff. They need some removal, some counter spells, some threats, and they have to have it all in a pretty timely manner. That's the challenge on the Murktide side. That said, it's not impossible. Uh, the Murktide deck can win. Um, sometimes they do get that all line up. Also, I think it's really important to discuss Urza's Saga when it comes to this matchup, because another angle the Murktide deck has to deal with, on top of everything else, is that let's say you're the Bant deck and you suspect a counterspell. You think that the Murktide player has one. You can. You don't have to just use your Urza Saga as kind of suspend to find Shuko. You can make constructs, and in this matchup, sometimes you win with constructs and one ones crashing into the red zone. Uh, it's more likely than you think. Yeah, we just saw four color now to uh, attack someone to death without ever even representing a combo. Uh, Kevin's on the play with a pair of Mishra's Bobble. And a scalding turn into Steam Vents. That is also Tamiya. That's a good start for Kevin. Yes. So this is interesting because I think Kevin has the he's going to have the option because he struggles to flip this Tamiya really quickly. And there's some interesting questions about how quickly he wants it to flip. Because notably, it's sometimes better to kind of delay the flip and make more clues before you can commit to that drawing free turn. And indeed, we see that he's he's kind of holding on to the, the second Mistress Bobble, kind of aligning things so he isn't going to flip the Tamiyo right away, and I think this is reasonable. He, he doesn't necessarily want to rush it. Cedric opted for a basic forest into a Shuko. One of three parts currently assembled. Yeah, and, and one reason Cedric's... Oh, I'm sorry. He is going to opt for the My apologies, my apologies. I thought he had delayed one of those responses to, to deploy this, but no. He is actually just going to flip the Tamiyo the Tami immediately. So we are going to see the Planeswalker hit the board instantly. Uh, so what this is going to mean is the Planeswalker Tamiyo uh, can really do two things. It can, one, buy back spells. Pretty good. Often counterspell is a, is a good one to buy back. It also can ultimate. And like most Planeswalker ultimates, it can, this one tends to end the game in short order. Now, it's going to be a few turns before Tammy, before he can get to that. Uh, Kevin cannot do... I think it costs seven to ult, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, but if we get there, it is going to draw half his library. Uh, literally. It's going to draw 30 cards. So, um, Cedric is now kind of under the gun in the sense that he has got to get some pressure down, arrange his combo, do something before Tamiyo hits seven loyalty. Remember when the days where your opponent didn't have Planeswalkers on the second turn? <laughs> no, no, that's that's before my time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but yes. Also, we I go. also want to call attention to the fact that Cedric did choose to fetch that basic forest. Uh, I wonder if he might be thinking about Blood Moon, a card these smart type decks often have uh, because of its ability to shut down Urza Saga. Yeah, there's, there's at least one copy in Kevin's deck, and uh, there, were, there was a, at least one post-board game already, so possible that Cedric did see that and respects it. Uh, Tamiyo's plus is a plus two, so it's already on six, and you were correct that it's ultimate is seven. Cedric's going to read it for a third time. It's got a lot of text on it. This is a card with a lot of words. 
Yeah, and, and I kind of like how Kevin has chosen to play this. Instead of giving that slow, grinding clue value, he's choosing just as quickly as possible, say, look, Cedric, you better kill me. You better do it quick, because this game is over in just a few turns. Or effectively over, I guess. Mm -hmm. Kevin with four cards in hand. Cedric deploys Nadu. Tempest counterspell nabs it, and Kevin fetches on Cedric's turn. Yeah, and you can see the pause from Cedric there. He, he wasn't excited to slam that Nadu. He was almost reluctant. And I think this makes a lot of sense. What Cedric's thinking is, look, I know he's going to counter it. I'd much prefer to kind of, you know, mess around, play a spring heart, do some other stuff first. But because of this cameo, because that ultimate is coming, Cedric feels priced into just jamming and hoping it works. He doesn't have time to navigate for the counter spells. He doesn't have time to make Kevin's life awkward. He has to just jam and hope that he can get something going before Kevin runs out of stuff. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Cedric obviously kept a real banger of a hand. It was turn one, uh, Shuko, turn two, Nantuko, turn three, Nadia. Representing the combo on the third turn, but Kevin had this incredible opener with the Tamiyo. Preordain alters the draw, replaces itself, and Kevin passes the turn in a pretty comfy position. Yeah, I see some questions in chat about what Tamiyo does. So just to be clear, when Kevin ultimates the Tamiyo, he draws half his deck, and he has no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. That's what it does. So if this happens, like, look, Cedric's just not going to be able to fight through that. It's, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what he draws. It doesn't matter what he finds. Half his deck is going to end the game. That will be slightly less than 30 when, when this happens. And Kevin's... Kevin's not even shy on Manny either. He, he's made excellent drops each turn of the game. They're sinking the stupor. Followed by Wall of Roots being deployed a second time from Cedric. Cedric's going to pass a turn. I think he knows what's and, going on. And in a longer game, the sink of the stupor might not be great. It, you know, it's, it's, it's a very temporary answer. It only solves the problem for a turn. Uh, you know, it, it's in the deck mainly because it's such a free roll, because it can be an untapped lane as well. But if you're about to draw 20-something cards, pretty good. Ah, Kevin made a good choice in drawing 20-something cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, your objection is fair. I, I did previously say 30 cards. You're right, this is probably like 23 or something. But I think it's going to be easily sufficient. And I think Cedric here is, is going to be demonstrating one of, uh, one of his finer qualities, honestly. Cedric is not someone who gives up easily. Cedric is someone who's very willing to kind of put in the effort and work for what he wants. And here you see him really showing this will of the warrior by not conceding. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot. Of no, I, I think you're right. Uh, if anything, this is just, you know, a little more practice for next round. Even if the writing's on the wall, you're going to get to see, you know, every tool under this is at Murktai deck. If, if you haven't played in a couple of months, maybe you need a little refresher course. Yeah, that's possible. I, I also think it's possible that Cedric is hoping that Kevin is just hideously unlucky, like play to his, you know, 1% out or whatever. Just hope that, you know, although Kevin drew 23 cards, 18 of them were lands, something like that. Uh, I understand that sounds absurd when I say it, and, I, you know, it probably seems absurd to Cedric too, but, you know, <laughs> he, he's not going to win any match points by conceding, so might as well try. Stranger things have happened. Uh, we've fired a lightning bolt upstairs, drag rates channel or triggers. For Kevin, Kevin with an embarrassment of riches, another lightning bolt. Drop Cedric to 13. Surveil trigger leaves the card on top. Draw stab, tick up Tamiyo. I'm sure we've got a land in there somewhere. Yeah, and uh, look, in a normal match here, I'd be trying to get a, a glimpse at Kevin's hand and discuss kind of 
you know, what his options are, what plays are available to him. But in this situation, I'm going to assume his options are roughly anything he wants, and the plays available to him are roughly the kitchen sink. And therefore, I will not be very specific. Marguerite's Chandler coming over. Going to knock Cedric down just a little bit. Kevin with an embarrassment of riches. Also deploy the second Tamiyo. Probably going to leave it on its uh, creature side. Most likely, although, you know, maybe he just wants to draw half his deck again. You know, if that's, if that's what he's feeling. <laughs> Counter spell was uh, the answer to Cedric's last hope, and that was a court of calling. Cedric now in top deck mode. Mm. All right, so, and we're getting word actually that at this point in the match, time has been called. And the reason this is interesting is this actually explains a lot about why Cedric didn't concede. But Cedric is very simply. Saying, look, like, I can't win this game. I'm losing, but I'm not sure you have enough turns left to kill me. Uh, I'm not under that much pressure, and there's not a lot of time. So Cedric is playing because, look, if Kevin can't present enough threats quickly enough, then Cedric will take his one match point. He will take his draw. Uh, so I think that's what's going on. The game is no longer about can Cedric win, but can Cedric avoid losing? A draw is better than a loss. You're absolutely right. and. You know, professional player of Cedric's caliber, he's he's going to take every every inch he can get. Uh, that is either the third or fourth counter spell on a copy of the One Ring out of Cedric. Now there is a third that's going to buy a turn from the One Ring. Kevin deploys a land. Kevin with infinite cards in hand. Looking at a wall of roots and a Shuko. Prudane, trigger the Dragon's Rage channeler. Surveil the Murktide Regent into the yard. Prudane nabs one of two cards, the other on the bottom. Yeah, this is the phase of the game that I've often described as cards changing zones. Uh, you know, Kevin's not doing much of anything. He's not exactly progressing his board. He's just finding the right cards, and probably the right cards are things like lightning bolts would probably be a good one. Uh, you know, something to kind of just close the door before that turn counter runs out. Indeed, indeed. And here's Murktide region, namesake of the deck. We're going to exile a whole bunch of useful things. Lightning bolts, counter spells, etc. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, that will ensure lethal on the next turn off the 8-8 body. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's a sequence where Kevin loses this game. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty over. <laughs> Just one more surveil, because why not? Came here to play magic. Let's play magic. Kevin says, I've locked it up. Go ahead and go. Burn the deck thinning moments of the game. Yeah, I mean, I to be clear, I, I think that this might we're we're pretty deep into terms of this point. Uh, you know. Is is wait? Does that turn three? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I believe Kevin does get one more turn, which I mean, which means I believe he's going to be able to win here. Uh, yeah. Even if Cedric deploys a blocker of some sort, I'm sure Kevin can get it out of the way. Yes. Yes. And, and indeed, I'm getting confirmation that 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 was Kevin's. Kevin was turn three. He has turn five, which means that. Presumably, on his turn, Lethal in the Air is going to be coming through, and I don't know what Cedric can do about it. Kevin's on top of those Mishra's Bobble Triggers. 
Cedric takes presumably his last draw of the game. Looks to have a couple of cards in the end, so we're going to see. Do we have a miracle? I honestly can't imagine what Cedric could do here. Uh, <laughs> I cannot name the cards. <laughs> Again, this is true warrior spirit by Cedric. Refusal to give up even in the face of certain doom. I love it. Very time raveler. Resolves. Okay, so we bounce, the, bounce, bounce that. All right, all right. And the pairing resolves, which means Cedric does get to resolve whatever he wants after this. Okay, okay. Honestly, that resolving is a is a huge surprise to Cedric. I think he was probably. Very skeptical that that would happen. Mm. Absolutely. Now we just need to solve the Flying Dragon Rage channel. Uh, if Cedric can do that in some way, he might buy a yeah. dog. I mean, the, the one ring would be an answer if he had enough mana, but I don't think he does. Uh, Nadu would simply get removed, I think. All of it could block. Uh, he could have a spot spell. spell. His opponent can't counter it. Tiberi's in play. So... Maybe Cedric found one of those? Question mark? Look on his face says no, but it's hard to get a read on a good poker player too. <laughs> yeah, I think Cedric has got the uh, the Stone Cold Killer look down. Although Tammy is also buying Lightning Bolt, which I think is lethal as well. So uh, I don't really see the plan. Uh, the plan is hope that Kevin falls asleep and forgets to take a turn. Ah uh, yes, this is this is known as a uh, meteor outs. Uh, we're we're in my circles, <laughs> you know. If if uh you know a small meteor hits the convention center and you know obliterates Kevin's side of the table, maybe Cedric can win then. <laughs> Kevin says expressive iteration. Cedric's like, yeah, you can expressive iteration. <laughs> He's like, what what are we doing here, man? <laughs> I really like Cedric's expression, sorry. <laughs> it was just like... Kevin's going for an achievement here. He wants to win with zero cards in his library. I, I guess. I, I didn't know about the achievements edition of this this, this event. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, you get little badges. Will there be some sort of a full listing of, of achievements and an accounting somewhere I, I could take a look at? Uh... No, I just made it up. Uh, I will continue to make up more achievements as the day goes on. Um, All right. Kevin says, I'm attacking for lethal. Cedric says, I have a court of calling. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can he court for something that matters? Uh, I mean, can he court for Nadu? I mean, he can, but the, the bolt will still kill him, I think. Wait. Maybe he. Uh, or, or he can court for like he can court for an answer in various ways. He can court for a storm drake, but yeah, I mean, I do think Kevin should have killed Terry first because I don't know why not. But it also I think is irrelevant. I mean, Kevin can just bolt Cedric post combat, right? Like none of this actually matters. I think. Indeed. All right, and and that's that's gonna about do it for this game. Hmm. Kevin on his Merc Tide takes it in three. Kevin's going to advance to two and oh. Okay, it looks like we're going to take just a short break. We'll be back with more modern action in just a few minutes. Go ahead and stay tuned. Yeah. 